Um, I think we have Zafar Bengaj on the line. Are you there, Zafar? Hello, Phil. Yes, I am. I, I made you wait a bit so that I could do commercial with you and for oh, you. That's fine. For, that's absolutely uh, pardon fine. Me, a commercial for us yes. using you. That, uh, <laughs> when no you lis listen to the Tate Report, you have a good chance of hearing Zafar Bengaj, Crescent hyphen online dot net. That is uh, and, uh, Zephyr, thank you very much for being with us. We Now, you were one of the principal figures in a very important program that took place on the weekend, and it spoke of, uh, it called for uh, public discussion and support of the people of Kashmir. And I congratulate you on calling that meeting, and, and, and because sitting there, attending it, I was very impressed with all the information and, of course, with the cloud over that information, which is the cloud being uh, hardly any discussion here uh, in, uh, in, in the New York Times, Globe Mail, it, exactly a, an issue we, were, we talked about earlier in the program. That there is a, this issue has been ignored, but it really cannot be ignored now uh, based on what is taking place here. Could you, could you talk to us about why you call the meeting, why this is urgent? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, since July the 8th, uh, there has been uh, a renewed surge in uh, people's protests against the continued uh, Indian military occupation of Kashmir, uh, which has been under occupation since uh, 1947. Uh, but there have been periodic upsurges in people's protests. And since the latest upsurge, uh, and the fact that there have been so many people that have been killed in the last four months, um, at least 100 people have been killed, thousands of people have been injured, and uh, in fact there are thousands of others that have been blinded or uh, you know, have suffered uh, injuries to, to their eyes because uh, the Indian uh, forces are using what are referred to as pellet guns. These are... Um, uh, steel uh, pellets uh, tipped with uh, rubber, and they are fired into people's faces or bodies. Uh, and when they hit their faces, uh, uh, particularly their eyes, of course, they go blind. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, uh, regrettably, uh, there hasn't been much coverage of this um, in the media here. In fact, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, there, ha there have been only one or two reports in our media. One uh, report appeared... Uh, in August in the Toronto Star, August 21st, I believe, uh, which was basically taken from the Associated Press. So it wasn't even the Star's own report. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there have been periodic reports. There was one report in the New York Times on August 29th. Uh, but other than that, there has been generally silence regarding this huge tragedy that is taking place there where people are being brutalized. And it's not a, an insignificant area because uh, the, the total Kashmiri population is something like 16 million, out of which 12 million are on the, uh, in the Kashmir that is under Indian occupation. And, of course, given the fact that there, India has 700,000 military personnel, another 70,000 or so what are referred to as Central Reserve Police Force, and then another 53,000 police force. So we are talking about more than 800,000 heavily armed uh, troops uh, in that small area uh, terrorizing the Kashmiri population. And, mm -hmm. and, of course, there is a long history to the Kashmiris' struggle. They basically want to have the right to hold a referendum. So we felt that it was important to call that meeting to draw attention to the ongoing tragedy of the Kashmiri people and to demand of our own government here in Canada, which was incidentally uh, on the Security Council back in 1948 and 49, when this issue had come before the Security Council, and the Security Council had voted unanimously. Uh, of course, there were three abstentions. There was no negative, I mean, uh, uh, op opposing vote against uh, or, or against this resolution, but that resolution specifically called for holding a referendum in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was in the beginning of 1948, then 1949, 50, 51. The last resolution that was um, uh, related to 
uh, Kashmir was in fact in June of uh, 1998. So in fact, there are a number of Security Council resolutions that call for holding a referendum, but for some reason, uh, India adamantly refuses to do so, and uh, what we refer to as the international community is turning a blind eye to uh, this long festering problem mm. that has, of course, spawned a number of other problems in the region. Yes, and incidentally, well, now the, it, it does seem to it's been moving like to a new stage here, right? Because of the presence, I think uh, you mentioned uh, the Indian troops number seven hundred thousand. And uh, a population that does not want them there, there has been resistance, and there was a, a young man who was uh, martyred there. Um, they seem to have moved to a new stage, which you would think that this would come back to that original UN uh, finding. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the young man that you are referring to, he was a 22-year-old um, uh, you know, young man. He um, was killed on the night of July the 8th, together with two of his colleagues. They were actually ambushed and then killed execution style. They could have been captured if the Indian Army wanted to, but uh, they actually wanted to kill him. And in fact, when they killed him, the next day, or, or that very night, uh, there were very sort of jubilant announcements on Indian television to say that we have got this man and we have got rid of him, etc., Mm -hmm. Because he had, his name was Burhan Wani. He had become very popular in Kashmir because he was media savvy. He was using the social media. He had become something of an icon for the resistance movement. And when he was killed the very next day on July the 9th, when his funeral was being held, 200,000 people or more people turned out for his funeral. I mean, mm -hmm. that was in, an incredible display of support for this young man who was martyred and a, a tight slap in the face of the Indian occupation forces. In fact, there was a curfew imposed, but the people defied the curfew, and uh, naturally the Indian army shot at them. Twenty-three people were killed, even in the funeral procession, and scores of other people were injured. And this has continued. There has absolutely been no let-up in the protests that people are holding over there. Uh, they are doing it with 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 bare arms, they, they don't have any weapons with them, but mm -hmm. they defy the curfew, they come out into the streets, uh, the youth hurl stones at the heavily armed troops, and of course the troops fire at them uh, either live bullets or pellet guns or uh, tear gas shells, and as a consequence, as I mentioned, uh, something like 15,000 people have been injured. And there have also been thousands of people that have been um, arrested, uh, kidnapped from their homes, and held without uh, any knowledge of their family as to where they are being held. Naturally, no charges have been leveled against them, much less a trial. So what has happened is that once again, the people of Kashmir have shown that they do not wish to have anything to do with India. They want their right to self-determination. They want to have a referendum. And the fact that India has tried to subdue them for 70 years and it has failed, and now this whole thing has come back again with such uh, uh, mm -hmm. vehemence, indicates that the people are just absolutely fed up with, with the Indian occupation. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if um, this issue is ignored uh, by the international community, by the United Nations, by the major powers, uh, then it has a very, very serious risk of escalating further and engulfing the entire region in a major conflict, yes. and which would be disastrous. But one of the tragedies that I have observed over the years is that the United Nations and other bodies uh, simply act as a fire brigade. If there's a crisis, they rush over there to try to douse the fire, and then they all go home and forget about it, mm -hmm. without looking at the causes of why the fire uh, occurred in the first place. Yes, And, of course, the basic issue in Kashmir is that the people of Kashmir do not wish to be part of India. I think 70 years of resistance should be enough to prove to the world that they have voted with their feet. They mm -hmm. are, in fact, holding a referendum with their feet. Yes. And if uh, physically they are not able to hold that referendum because of the occupation army, it does not mean that they have accepted that situation or that they would be 
uh, cowed down by this massive, massive Indian military presence over there. Yeah, uh, this is uh, the voice of uh, Zafar Benkash. It is crescent-online.net, and there is excellent editorials and comments at that site uh, about this issue. And again, uh, Zafar, you, of course, reminded everyone, and it is just simply a fact. This has to do with, of course, the, the devolution uh, that didn't devolve, I guess, of the British Empire, uh, which dates are the same for Palestine as for um uh, Kashmir. Yes, exactly. In fact, uh, you know, uh, during the, the program, I had, um, uh, you know, mentioned this, that regrettably, many problems in the world can be traced directly to British colonial intrigue. Wherever they set foot and wherever they were uh, forced to leave, then instead of leaving uh, in a manner that... Um, uh, there would be no problems left behind. The British work hard to deliberately create problems. Hmm. And Kashmir was one of those problems that the British deliberately created. Of course, Palestine was the other. And and one of the speakers uh, at that conference where you also spoke, incidentally, and, and I might add you spoke very eloquently, people were very impressed by your presentation, uh, Ken Stone from the um, Canadian Peace Alliance mm-hmm. actually addressed this issue of the similarities between the Indian occupation of Kashmir and uh, Israel's occupation of Palestine. And these are, of course, both uh, problems that can be traced directly to British intrigue, and they left these unexploded bombs in the region that continue to create havoc with the lives of the people over there. Yeah, an unexploded foreign policy. They they revisit... uh, well, uh, thank you very much for that. I, we, we, I, I was, as I said, very impressed uh, that this matter was so eloquently addressed by so many people there. But also just the fact we're talking, what is it? Is it 12 million people, would you say, the population in Kashmir? The total population of uh, Kashmir is 16 million, 16. but 12 million are under Indian occupation. And, and I'm glad that you, you raised this point because I also wanted to point out that uh, the the Kashmiris that live on the Pakistani side, there have never been any protests or any uprisings. In fact, the Kashmiris that live on the Pakistani side, one of the most remarkable things about them is that their literacy rate at 72% is about 20% higher than the national average in Pakistan. So mm. that is how dedicated these Kashmiris are. They have thrived. They thrived, absolutely. Their economy is thriving. Uh, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of Kashmiris from that region, the Pakistani side, they have settled in Britain and other parts of the world. Uh, they have, uh, you know, in fact, um, a couple of years ago, we had invited uh, l- uh, two members of the British House of Lords, Lord Nazir Ahmed and Lord Qurban Hussain. They both happen to be from the Pakistani side of Kashmir, whereas you know the the people from the Indian side, uh, unemployment is something like fifty percent over there among the youth, when seventy two percent of the uh, population in the Indian side of Kashmir is under thirty years of age. Uh, so unemployment is a major problem, and of course with this uh, continued uh, military occupation, um, uh, since tourism is the sort of main source of earning for the people in on the Indian side of Kashmir. Uh, when when there, are, there are troubles, there is an army of occupation, there are checkpoints uh, every few hundred yards. Obviously, tourists are not going to go into that area. So the, the people on the Indian side of Kashmir, regrettably, are suffering tremendous dislocation. And just to sort of conclude, in the last four months, there has been virtually round-the-clock curfew. Now, you can imagine what impact it is going to have on the lives of the people. Uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. food has declined, like, you know, obviously, because no food can be imported. Medicines are in desperately short supply, and people's lives have been turned absolutely miserable because they are locked down uh, inside their homes. And, of course, the only people that come out are the youth uh, that, uh, you know, defy the bullets and the guns and the tear gas shells to mm-hmm. protest their uh, anger or express their anger at the occupation forces over there. Mm. Well, it, I, 
I'm convinced based on what I'm reading and, listen, and seeing is that this matter is not going – obviously is not going away, but it might – be quickly moving to center stage. And of course, by the way, you point out, and we all should remind everyone, we're talking about nuclear armed states who are, have a difference of opinion here. So the other states of the world ought to be a little more um, uh, vigilant and to do their duty uh, by, carry, by actually uh, demanding that the 48 resolution uh, be acted on, which is a plebiscite, which is democratic and is and to be solved without an army being present. Exactly. In fact, that resolution specifically called for, first of all, of course, the ceasefire, which, is, which was, you know, brought about. And then it said that the armed forces that have entered that region should be withdrawn. Now, here, here is the situation. Pakistan agreed to that and it withdrew its forces. Mm-hmm. India refused to do it. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, as a consequence, the problem has continued. And, of course, the other aspect was the holding of the referendum. And they, uh, the resolution said that um, these armed forces should be withdrawn from Kashmir so that uh, international observers can come and um, make mm-hmm. arrangements for a referendum. So yeah. India refused, and as a consequence, these international observers cannot come. And even if they come, you can't hold a referendum under the shadow of guns and bayonets. No, uh, by the way, I think that's an, an agreed principle uh, amongst people who advocate, you know, self-determination and democracy. You cannot have soldiers and police all at all the street corners and then say you're having an election because it, they, that's intimidation and it's, it's just too problematic. It, it means you, this process is spoiled. Uh, exactly. And, you know, one other point that I think um, uh, our listeners should uh, keep in mind, and that is that uh, India claims to be the largest democracy in the world. And one would have thought that a country making such a claim shouldn't have a problem with holding a referendum in a region that is internationally recognized as a disputed region, not part of India. Kashmir has never been part of India. And yet the so-called largest democracy in the world is afraid of holding a referendum in Kashmir. Because India knows, incidentally, that if there were a referendum, the Kashmiris overwhelmingly would vote to not be part of India. And they would want to join Pakistan because they they can see and they know and they uh, understand that their brethren on the other side of the what is referred to as the line of control, they are uh, happy, they are prosperous, they are thriving, they are doing well, and the people on, under Indian occupation also would like to be in that situation. Yep. Well, well, thank you for that. Now, it's, and again, it's Zafar Bengesh, uh, and it's crescent-online.net. Um, we have to ask you about this, uh, the burning issue of Syria, and uh, I guess I better say Syria and Iraq. Uh, it's the Western media has agreed that the terrorists are in uh, Mosul and that they need to be the city needs to be liberated. Uh, in Aleppo, everybody agrees that the terrorists are there, but they don't seem to be so enthusiastic about the city being uh, liberated. Um, and could you talk about these two cities? Uh, who are the forces? I think we spoke to you earlier, but it seems to me in Mosul. There's a lot of special problems attached to the struggle there because not all the elements who are now encircling the city are actually in agreement with each other about what they want. You are absolutely right. In fact, um, in in Mosul, uh, you have the Iraqi army that is uh, conducting its operations from the southeast of the city. And then you have the Kurdish forces they are referred to as Peshmerga, which means they, you know, frontline fighters willing to die. They are coming from the northeast. Mm-hmm. And then you have the Americans and the Turks also involved in it. And the Iraqi central government has repeatedly demanded of Turkey to withdraw its forces from Iraq's territory because these forces have come in illegally without the permission of the Iraqi government. And another, an additional complicating factor is that while the the operations are taking place from the north, the northeast, 
south and southeast, the westerly exit from Mosul is still open, which mm. means that these terrorists can escape from the city and the province and head straight towards Syria. And I have the feeling that both the Turks and the Americans are actually there in order to facilitate this. Mm -hmm. And there have been reports, confirmed reports, that um, not only these terrorists, but also their families have been evacuated from here, and they have gone to Raqqa, which is the border town, which is supposed to be the second sort of secondary capital, because Mosul was the first capital of these terrorist groups. Raqqa in Syria is the second capital, and they're all congregating over there. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Aleppo, which is further west of Raqqa or northwest of Raqqa, in a portion of Aleppo, Aleppo on the eastern side, these terrorists are holed up. And when uh, Syrian and Russian forces carry out operations, there is immediately hue and cry against that, alleging that, well, they are killing civilians and this and that, etc. Uh, whereas in Mosul, there is no problem about killing civilians or bombing them, whatever. Mm -hmm. But now an operation has started against Raqqa as well. But again, it's problematic because the forces that are involved in the operations against Raqqa are Kurdish forces. And... Turkey is opposed to that because Turkey does not want the Kurds in its uh, territory and the ones in Iraq and Syria to link up with each other. So here we have a problem between Turkey and the United States. The U.S. is backing the Kurdish forces uh, attacking Raqqa, but Turkey is opposed to them, whereas both of them are cooperating with each other to facilitate the exit of the terrorists from Mosul to allow them to flee to Raqqa. So it's just a, a, an absolute mess over there, which mm. indicates that, regrettably, all of this talk about fighting against terrorists, etc., is just not credible, mm -hmm. because there are you know, countries and groups, etc., that want to keep these terrorists on their side. And, of course, these terrorists operating in, in Syria are financed by regimes like Saudi Arabia and Qatar that are close allies of the United States, and mm -hmm. they want to keep them there because their aim is to somehow overthrow the legitimately uh, established government of Syria. They have failed so far, but they haven't given up on their nefarious designs to overthrow a legitimately established government in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask you about uh, the... And, and it is simply no the, – the reporting is so dis awful that it, it isn't noted that uh, along a ceasefire – not a ceasefire, but a, a, um, a decision not to bomb eastern Aleppo in order to defeat these terrorists uh, was taken by the Russian and Syrian governments. It, they've extended it. They've offered corridors, which when they do offer the corridor, uh, the terrorists – fire on it so as the people cannot leave. Um, these things, this has taken place, has it not for almost, it's been almost two weeks of this high tolerance of the presence of a terrorist group. The, and here there is no media discussion of that. As a matter of fact, they treat it almost the opposite. Yes. Uh, you know, that's exactly, uh, you know, the situation that both uh, Russia and Syria uh, not only offered to have a ceasefire, but they actually uh, implemented a ceasefire so that those, these uh, relief convoys could go into eastern Aleppo to provide food for the people that are trapped there and also to enable the people to leave from there. And yet the terrorists over there are refusing to allow the people to leave because they are using them as human shields. And number two, they wouldn't allow any food to get into eastern Aleppo. And then they say, well, look, people are starving over here. Well, as far as the terrorists are concerned, they are not starving. So what is happening is that they are stealing all the food to them, for themselves, and they are deliberately starving the people and then blaming Syria and Russia on, on the situation. Mm -hmm. So they won't allow these people to leave, 
and any food convoys that try to enter eastern Aleppo, the terrorists fire upon them. They have destroyed a number of trucks. They have killed people. This is all well mm-hmm. documented, well established. And yet, regrettably, there is so little mention of these things. Quite the contrary. Anytime there is any problem with the civilians in eastern Aleppo or in the rest of Aleppo city and province, it is immediately blamed on the Syrian government and the Russians. Mm -hmm. There is a gross distortion of the reality of the situation on the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, one matter, if I can just uh, quickly on it, I just can't let this go by since there's going to be a vote tomorrow involving Mr. Trump and Hillary. Um, I I was watching a central figure in in the Hillary's campaign, and his name is Howard Dean. This past summer, he attended a gathering in Paris of an Iranian terrorist guerrilla group uh, who is led, it's led by a kind of a cult figure. I don't remember her name. Yes. Now, Mariam, her name is Mariam Rajavi. Now, she gave a speech, or he did, rather me, at, at that gathering saying, when Hillary gets in, you will benefit. She's your best friend. Now, uh, could you tell us who they are and what, <laughs> why that people voting tomorrow ought to know about that? Yes, this this group, the Mujahideen, it's called the Mujahideen Khalq Organization. Until about uh, two, three years ago, this group was on the U.S. Uh, terrorist list. Until two, three years ago, because this group was involved in horrific crimes inside Iran. They were involved in bombing campaigns. They were planting car bombs. They killed a lot of civilians. Uh, in, of course, many leaders of Iran after the revolution, uh, and yet, regrettably, this group maintained offices a few blocks away on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., and a number of American congressmen and women were supporting this terrorist group. And of course, two, three years ago, the U.S. took them off their terrorist uh, designation, designated mm-hmm. list. And as you mentioned, there was this meeting in Paris a few months ago, and all kinds of unsavory characters were there. Howard Dean was there, uh, Rudy Giuliano was there, and also the the Saudi, the former Saudi intelligence chief, yes. Turkey Al Fasl was there, and a number of other unsavory characters. And they all told them that you know we are going to support you, we will support your struggle. They were openly supporting terrorists over there. Yep. And and this woman that claims to be the leader of this thing, because uh, her husband, Masood Rajavi, it is believed that Masood Rajavi was killed, but this mm-hmm. woman now is uh, leading this, this um, uh, so-called organization that has incidentally no support whatsoever in Iran. It, it basically is a bunch of uh, terrorists that are involved in terrorist activities, and they want to overthrow mm-hmm. a legitimately established government in Iran through... Uh, acts of terrorism. And if uh, Hillary Clinton were to be elected uh, tomorrow, uh, regrettably, uh, a lot of, you know, I mean, she's on record. She's also, uh, you know, she's a, she's a woman who, who is yeah. all gung-ho. She's with the militaristic wing of the Washington establishment. She was the one responsible for the, the killing of uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, the leader of Libya. Uh, she is the one who has said that she would go ahead and bomb Syria and all mm-hmm. kinds of other terrible things. So I'm afraid, uh, you know, if she were to be elected, and it seems likely that she might be, then I think big, the world is going to face a lot of big, problems. There will uh, be big trouble. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, Zafar, okay. you have answered all of our questions very eloquently. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Phil. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. Sure. Take care. Sure thing. Thanks. Bye-bye. This, this is the Taylor Report. Remember, next week we're going to build this station and build the program, so be sure to tune in and support us. And thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Phil. And uh, Indigenous Waves are coming in.